Hugh, you are, you know, you've done countless theatre productions, you've done the Oscars, you are absolutely no stranger to a live audience. But now this is an arena show, right. so a very different thing. Right. What kind of opportunities does this give you? What are you going to do to make this unlike anything else you've done? Doing an arena show for me is perhaps the ultimate because of the amount of energy that you can create and excitement you can create. And surprisingly to me, after doing an arena show in Australia three years ago, and I will probably up until then I wasn't sure you could do this, you can create an amazing kind of intimacy. Um, it has to be specially crafted, but I think when I go to arenas, I love it when I feel people go off script. Like when Adele starts talking about her day, when she starts going on about the babysitter, this and that. Like, you love it. You feel like something happened just that night, mm -hmm. right? And that's always been my template for theatre. You know, uh, we have so many places we can watch, entertainment, film, thing, or stream, or whatever, but nothing can replace the live aspect where something could happen that night. So that's what I try to create. And uh, surprisingly, I actually think my show, which I've done in a smaller theatre, I think it works better in the arena. And it being you know, a show that is your name, you get to do whatever songs you want. It's yeah. very selfish. Be very selfish, exactly. Very self-indulgent. Exactly. <laughs> Are there any um, songs? I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for my parents to say, Hugh, that's, stop that. That's just <laughs> Are there any artists or songs that you would like to cover that might surprise people? Oh. Uh, well, I'm definitely going to do stuff that people are probably expecting from The Greatest Showman, from Les Miserables, from things I've done on stage. I love a musical called Dear Evan Hansen, which has been a big hit in, uh, but I will never get to play the 17 year old uh, protagonist. So I'm gonna do that. And I'm actually learning to play it on the piano, which I haven't done. So that's gonna be surprising to me and everyone. So we'll see how that goes. I'm working on that. Um, and let me think other surprises. Uh, yeah, there will be surprises. I don't, I'm, uh, in my head, I'm trying to say, how do I frame this without telling people what it is? There's not only going to be some guests, but there's just going to be some stuff that people wouldn't associate me with. And also, hopefully, some of the stories I tell are surprising. I mean, over the years and in interviews, I've told a lot of things, but I want this show to be more revealing and more personal than ever before. You mentioned uh, The Greatest Showman. The album... Um, of that movie has been either number one or close to number one for approximately 400 years now. <laughs> um, do you, I, how nuts is that, that it's it been nuts. like number one for so, so long? You know, it's, it's not my world, right, music. I'm not a recording artist. I've done a few cast albums and things like that. So my kids are getting so sick. And in my wife, like, guys, it's the 28th week at number one. Like, and I still get that excited about it for many reasons, knowing the kind of hurdles we had to cross to get the music made, to get Justin and Benj into the room. Uh, the director lied to the studio about who they were. He lied that they'd won a Tony Award because the studio was like, who, who are these Justin and Benj? I've never heard of them. And they wanted, you know, Pharrell and all these, you know, Bruno, they wanted names. And uh, he, he lied that they'd won a Tony Award for James and the Giant Peach. And of course, this exec didn't know much about theatre, so he said, oh, okay. There's never been a Broadway production of James and the Giant Peach. So knowing we started from there to having won the Grammy Award last week and having one of the most successful albums of all time is, it's amazing. But bottom line to me, from the moment I heard that music, it made me cry and I loved it. Like I still love the music. I went to a spinning class the other day and they were playing The Greatest Showman from beginning to end. I thought everyone's gonna think this guy is a little weird. Like is he put his own music on? But I had nothing to do with it. But the energy in it, in that, and of course, no one knows the music more than me. I just love it. So to have that music and to sing it every night on this tour is going to be thrilling. I mean, I hope you sang along because I know that's exactly what that spin class would have wanted. Hundred percent. And perhaps the microphone came over to me at one point. Incredible. Yeah. Thank God no one had their phone out because that would have looked just looked really bad, like, <laughs> dude. Um, you got enough attention. Give it a rest. I know many parents who absolutely love this movie, love the music, but have yeah. kids who have not let them listen to anything else <laughs> for the best part of a year. Do you get any backlash from very angry parents? <laughs> I, get a, I get a little bit of like, thank you, my kids are so happy and we're hoping that they might find something else that they like. I do get a bunch of that. Um, but in general, I, I, 
it's just been amazing to me. My daughter is a dancer, so I go. I used to go every week to her dance studio, and I, I'd get a little bit from the parents. Ah, oh, that's Wolverine guy or whatever. Like a week after the showman came out, I heard. First of all, there were four studios, and two of them were playing <laughs> songs for the Great Showman. But all these kids and these parents—it's sort of been a, a new thing for me. And to watch something you do connect on such a deep level, I've had parents send me videos of their kid. One parent sent had an autistic kid who'd never really moved, w would walk occasionally, obviously, but never moved. And the only time it really moves is when they play The Greatest Showman and he dances and he plays it. And this woman sent me a video of that and just her crying. And that, of course, means the world to me. And do you, with anything that is as successful as this, there are there are always are some people who are a bit sniffy about it oh, and yeah, a bit snobbish. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Does any, like, what's your, what's your take on that? Does that reach you? Does that bother you? Now look, if I invented chocolate ice cream, right, and people came up and said, I hate chocolate, I'd be going, all right, that's okay. There's loads of people who love it. I never expect, you know, in the end, I'm a storyteller, I suppose. I'm an actor who tells stories. And, uh, you know, I think some people didn't like The Greatest Showman. I'm like, okay, fine. That's, it's fine with me, you know, and I don't, because enough, it meant a lot to a lot of people. If you do spend a lot of time and nobody likes it, that's a little difficult because you think, wow, I really got off track there. Like, I really thought this would connect and it didn't. But of course, people are sniffy. It's a quite commercial, it's down the middle. There were some people who wanted us to do different things to the character than what we were doing. And, and that's okay. I mean, I, I don't know if people go in with their head full of ideas or if they go in empty and just don't like it, it's, it's fine. And you, okay. these songs, you perform them so many times. How do you keep them interesting? How will you keep them interesting for yourself? Oh, I love them. I, uh, I, I do not do a song. If I ever have that feeling, I, uh, I cut the song. And no offense to all, everyone there, but I, at the end of the day, I'm a big believer that how you feel as a performer on stage totally translates to the audience. So you might love the song, but if you're watching someone sing it and thinking, I hate this song, it won't, something won't connect. So trust me, there is nothing in this show that I don't absolutely love. Um, and the showman stuff in particular, I just, the energy of it, I just, I love it. And the heart, I think. You know. And some of those songs are really hard. I mean, you didn't have to sing, you obviously you sang them, yeah. but you didn't have to sing them, you know, night after night, live on the film. You, there was, there's some big notes in that and Les Mis. Like, how do you feel about the, like doing yeah, them live? Yeah, well, I think I have some, so when you do a film, when Les Mis, it was live, you are probably singing it 30 times a day, as opposed to once a night, 30 times. And I have done enough theatre of eight shows a week to know that I can do it. I, I, I take the singing very seriously because I didn't start as a singer. So I, I learned how to be a singer and I have singing lessons twice a week and I warm up very carefully and I really watch that protect my voice. It's very important to me. But, you know, hopefully, fingers crossed, touching wood, everything will be okay. And um, you're going to be in, you're obviously in the summer for the shows. Glastonbury is around that time. Oh. Every Glastonbury, there's always there's always a slot on the Sunday afternoon, which is yeah. they get someone in, great sing-along one. Would you be interested in doing that? Yeah, but I'd never heard of this before. You're the first person to mention it, so I don't know if you have any contacts. Uh, loads. I'll, you know, I'll put, I'll put, <laughs> the Evises I know very well. I'll what date is contact. it? Uh, 26th of June. Uh, problem. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm going to be in the, in the US at that point. Oh, that is a shame. Yeah, I finish in London on the 7th. Maybe they can move Glastonbury. You know what? If that's okay. Is that asking too much? I don't think that's asking too much. That'd no. be great. That's just like three weeks earlier. It'd be great. I think they can do it. <laughs> um, you, like, you're going to be all around the world. Like, yeah. you're, from knowing audiences, is there any um, city or any country that has particularly standout audiences that are unlike any others? Hmm. It's going to be a lot of firsts for me. Um, so... I did something very recently in Salt Lake City and I was kind of blown away. But I have been on tours before and I don't want to say which city, but I've been on tours before where people have said, oh, this city is going to be not as great and found it not to be the case. And I, I kind of would like, it, it's the same thing in life when people say to me, you know, Ollie, it's, mm, Ollie's going to be a bit... Mm. I go, I don't kind of need your opinion in a way. 
because it turns out you are a little bit, but I didn't know that. I'm, I'm kidding. Of course, I think take every person, every audience, as though you've never done the show before and as though you're going to do it for the last time. And I remember what it's like when my father would take me to see a concert or a show when I was young, the excitement I felt. And I don't really care if you come from Glasgow, London, Los Angeles, Salt Lake City, you know, Manchester. I know that that's something universal. So what I'm interested in, and, and I think experience has told me noise doesn't necessarily mean love. Mm -hmm. So some audiences can be really quiet. Like Australian audiences are quiet in the theatre. American audiences are loud. But by the end, Australia will be like really loud. But they'll be quiet for a lot of it. There'll be a little bit of this at first and then, you know, so they can present in a different way. But in the end, it feels very similar. That was a long answer. It was a very good answer. Was it? Yes. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Ollie. Cheers. Thank Great you so to much. See you, man. You too.